all for coming to Straight Science. And Straight Science is an evening science presentation put on by UAF Northwest Campus in Nome and also UAF Alaska Sea Grant, also in Nome. And this is the home office these days. And UAF, both Northwest Campus and Alaska Sea Grant, we serve the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Yupik, Inupiaq, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. And tonight's speaker, it's gonna be something new for me. And I think you might wanna put yourself in presentation mode, Jim. Did I not um, do that? Uh, it, is, it is not in presentation mode, but it's, we can see it. Okay. So it, it, looks, it looks good. Let's see. So, so does, that, so does that look better? Is that full yes, screen Yes, that's right on the okay. money. And we can still see you. So that's good. And so tonight we're presenting Jim Thorson. Jim is a statistical ecologist with NOAA, Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. And he leads the Habitat and Ecological Processes Research Program. And tonight he's talking about NIMPS RAP. And so some people actually commented, are you going to be giving it in sort of, you know, but it's actually an acronym for regional access, or sorry, regional, um, Ugh. I just action went blank. Plan. Regional action plan. Read the slide. Regional action plan for the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. I might, this is novel for the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. And so, uh, and actually it's fairly new process for the Bering Sea. And I think it's something that Jim's wanting to, wanting to share and make this whole process uh, more understandable to us. Cause I think it's a, they're going for interconnecting and getting more advice from the regions. So we're really excited to hear about that. And there's also one for the Bering Sea, and maybe some other time we'll hear about that. But tonight we're focused on from Diomede on up, I think is the That's target it. area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with that, take it away, yeah. uh, Jim Thorson. We're really glad you're here and can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gay. Um, thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, I'm, I am really excited to be here. I wish I could uh, attend in person and I'm sure I'll get up to Nome at some point in more more normal times um you know you were saying about you know whether i beatbox this or something i i i'll admit that i got this new headset and it kind of makes me feel like i'll have you know like in a boy band and that i'll have some like dancers coming behind me um i wish it were so exciting um but yeah i'm here to here to present to this regional action plan for the chukchi and beaufort seas and before I get, get going, I want to acknowledge that this is, um, you know, I've had discussions with many people who are listed here. These are all co-authors on a, on a report that we wrote. Um, it's supposed to be out for public comment any time now. And we, um, I'm sorry that I don't know exactly the timing of that. They're being done across the country by different NIMPS offices. And for some reason, that process is being held up. Out, it, it's outside my hands, but um, I'd be happy to share a version of the document. It's, it, it is available online already. It just doesn't have the formal public comment period yet. Um, some of the some of the names here, maybe some of you know, maybe not. Um, but yeah, thank you, Mabel, for being on the call. And um, yeah, I'll, I'm excited to get going. So, um, you know, I recognize that this is my first chance to talk with uh, with many people on the call and. So I'll start out with a little bit of my, you know, family and, you know, personal background, um, you know, because of course I love talking about this. I love talking about my family. I, um, I've got a picture here that I, I dug up online in preparation for the talk of my, of my grandfather, Thomas Thorson. I knew him for a, a, an amazing penny collection that I did with him as a kid. Um, but he also was a, a shark biologist in Nebraska. Um, and, um, you know, that side of the family is the sort of Norwegian extraction in the upper Midwest. His formidable wife was, um, had MS and I knew her in an electric wheelchair. She for decades had been um, an activist for Americans with disabilities. Um, and and they, they raised my wonderful father who's a computer programmer. And so, you know, my work in some ways is an obvious sort of merge of my grandfather and my father's work. Um, my mother's side comes from this the South, from the Southern U.S., um, you know, from more, um, you know, sort of humble work. Uh, my mother has been a school counselor for decades and just recently retired. And I'd like to think that I, 
um, kind of continue to have an interest in um, in people beyond the sort of technical skills that I got from my from my father's side of the family. Um, and then, you know, in terms of me, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Um, I spent time out east. I, I did a, a, a undergrad in philosophy and environmental studies in Atlanta um, before a master's in fishery science at Virginia Tech, and then a PhD back here in Seattle. Um, you know, I've, I've been with NIMPS since 2012 when I was a stock assessment scientist. And then since 2018, I've been in my current position. Um, as Gay said, I lead the Habitat and Ecological Processes Research Program. I supervise nobody and have no budget, um, but I'm still um, tasked with trying to coordinate across the center. And, um, you know, I do that by bugging people at the center, basically, about, um, you know, how we can better deal with, you know, better understand habitat changes and basic fundamental ecology to predict how you know, for instance, how species are going to shift in distribution under climate change, you know, how nearshore habitats contribute to offshore um, production of fish, um, you know, how, you know, we can sample marine mammal stomachs, you know, and use cutting edge genetics to figure out how they, they, they forage. And so I have this really broad uh, plate of ecological work that I try to do with a, a wide range of colleagues. I don't have um, a whole lot of like hard power at the center, but I have sort of a microphone and I have been trying to do it since I arrived. Um, I've been trying to use that microphone to emphasize the importance of um, loss of sea ice and, you know, climate related impacts in the, in, in the, in the Bering Sea, the Northern Bering Sea and, and, and north from there. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, the Arctic wrap has been, um, an outgrowth of, of work I've been doing since I arrived at the Alaska Center three years ago. And again, I'm sorry that I don't know more people. Um, I was telling Gay that, you know, there's a government shutdown when I started and then and then and then the last two years have been a real wash in terms of getting to know people um, in any kind of real way. Um, but um, I shouldn't say it that that hardly, you know, harshly. I've, I've had a great time chatting with people online, but it's it is harder to meet, you know, make connections and um, coastal communities and Alaska Native groups, you know, doing things by, by, by Zoom, I think. So um, anyway, the Arctic Wrap is, um, it's, a, it's a regional process to implement, to envision, to discuss, to communicate, and to track activities responding to something called the NOAA Fisheries Climate Science Strategy. And the, the NOAA Fisheries Climate Science Strategy is, um, is this this national process that the National Marine Fisheries Service has done? It's um, you know it's laid out in I'm going to forget now around 2015, and um, you know in the bottom right we've got this sort of figure from the National Climate Science Strategy about how we need to be building and maintaining adequate science infrastructure. We use this to track change. We try to understand mechanisms of change so that we can project future conditions under climate. And then we try to do this adaptive management um, by using management strategies that are robust to climate change um, and then climate informed reference points. I mean, that's really a kind of um, fisheries management issue, but um, it might not be as relevant to, to everyone. But um, the point is that it's this national effort to um, envision and coordinate uh, you know, responses at every science center to climate. And the Alaska Fishery Science Center, you know, which is um, based in Juneau and in Seattle and, and has offices in other areas, um, including Anchorage and um, Kodiak and Newport, Oregon. Um, the Alaska Fishery Science Center saw the, the wraps and we decided that we wanted to include research related to monitoring, to process research, which is sort of ways of understanding basic ecology, to trying to figure out how we can synthesize this to do better um, better management or give better advice, doing research related to marine mammals and also social and human dimensions. Um, I should say before I get going, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how much, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of talking longer about the wrap here because, you know, Gay and I were talking about how the whole process hasn't been communicated in straight science before. And so I'm used to, I'm used to a culture of people kind of just jumping in and inter interrupting. And I hope that people feel comfortable doing that. 
Um, I'll just keep talking um, until I hear somebody interrupt me and tell me to move on. So, so um, this, so, so this, thank this you for saying. So this is an it's an AFSC led document. It's not, it's not, um, you know, wasn't developed in a in a really bottom up driven way. It was developed by a bunch of AFSC scientists, um, and it's intended to be a way to prioritize like reimbursable funding. So different different sort of pots of money that don't aren't reliable every year, but do come in, and we try to coordinate how to spend them in ways that are, um, you know, responsive to climate change in the Arctic. Um, we're trying to identify areas where Alaska Fishery Science Center researchers can collaborate internally and with external partners, and we're really trying to build some internal consensus first about what key science gaps that there are in the Arctic. And as so, you'll see, Jim, I mean, we yeah. So, because you, uh, you had said you'd like us to interrupt you, so it's free, I, normally please. people wait I'll for cut, questions. I'll cut you off if I need us to keep moving, but please do. Okay, so normally people, uh, you know, say, oh, hold your questions to the end, but I just want to reiterate to everybody, you're okay. Uh, yeah, 100%. I mean, if, I, if, it, if it's going too long, I hope people don't mind if, no, I, no. if I put off some stuff, but yeah, please do. Okay, so I just wanted to make that clear, and I have, I have, I have one question, just looking Go at the it, five planning categories for all regional action plans. Is there an overarching objective? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's no objective statement. There is a vision statement that I don't okay. think I, I put in. Yeah, here, here we go. So we'll get to a vision statement in a couple okay. of slides. Uh, I'm, I'm too early. All right. I'll let you be. Yeah, go okay. Um, but I mean, the core of it is that we need, I mean, before we can, um, be effective at doing anything. I mean, the Alaska Fishery Science Center has to come to some agreement about what we what we think is important work, and that's what I'm what I'm trying to present. And you'll see that part of what we think is important work is figuring out how to bring in um, in, input from Alaska Native and coastal communities about the next round of the wrap, and um, and that's part of what I'm here to do today to kind of start a conversation about that. Um, so I'll, I'll get through a couple more slides and let's come back to that game. So um, the Arctic wrap, it's, it's, a, it's a planning document for the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas in the US economic zone. It's not Alaska state waters. Um, this corresponds to the Arctic fisheries management plan area, which is shown in the top right. And, um, you know, up to the convention line, um, you know, you have to draw a line somewhere. And, um, and I and I note that you know I realize that the um, Bering Strait communities might care more about the areas just to the south of us, and that you know south of the uh, of the Strait is covered by the Bering Sea Regional Action Plan that is also um, will be out for public comment around the same time. Um, in terms of the process, we did it. I mean, again, we you know we're trying to you know for the first time we're trying to come up with sort of a coherent plan at the Alaska Fisher Science Center about how to do climate responsive research in the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas. And so we did that. You know, we don't even you know we didn't at the beginning of this necessarily even know what all the programs were doing in this area. So we convened meetings. We had everybody you know present what they've been doing. We had kind of sub leads. Um, that identified a bunch, you know, a whole hodgepodge of different things that we're doing or could be doing. And I and the sub leads kind of discussed and hashed it out to come up with basically in a list of 11 activities that we think are especially important. And those are all basically I'm here doing kind of a show and tell of those 11 activities. They all come out of things we're currently doing in one way or another. Um, and so hopefully that's of interest to people to see that kind of show and tell about what's the different things the Alaska Center is doing in this area. And then it's and then it's to start a conversation about what, you know, how we could do how we can do this plan better next time we update it. So in this Arctic wrap, we envision this targeted portfolio of monitoring process research and synthesis, including lower trophic levels, you know, like plankton, fish, marine mammals, and humans. Um, you know, envisioning activities in the next three years. And we really want to develop, you know, over that time, I think the biggest success of the RAP would be developing a more collaborative research environment in which, discuss, you know, discussions and partnerships with Alaska Natives and coastal, coastal communities is a central element. Um, so that the Arctic Regional Action Plan can involve components that are co-produced in, in a future update. Um, 
I'm not going to talk much about the inventory of past work. I'm just going to skip straight to the 11 future activities. Um, so the first one is, um, you know, without any further ado, <laughs> the first of these 11 activities, I'm just going to go through these 11 in, in, in pieces here. Um, the first one is trying to, um, you know, basically promote interdisciplinary partnerships by trying to come up with these indigenous conceptual models. So basically, um, you know, working with communities there to um, solicit input about how the ecosystem works in ways that are relevant to people there and using that development to document ways that we could do that collaboration better in the future. Um, you know, so sort of the acknowledgement that humans are part of the ecosystem that includes, um, you know, so social relations, there's a sense of place, there's a spiritual dimension, there's questions of identity, and so on. You can read the list. And, you know, these are all ways in which, you know, we as a center need to undertake understanding humans as part of an ecosystem. Um, you know, do, you know, including these is not what I was trained to do as an ecologist. Um, and, you know, in terms of ecology, it'll take novel approaches um, that are, are representative, that are inclusive and rooted in experience. Um, you know, what is an indigenous conceptual model? Well, um, a lot of times we start with what's called, a, you know, I mean, we work with these conceptual models all the time where people list um, components of the ecosystem that matter. And those could be physical elements, they could be aspects of human health, um, you know, or human culture. And, and then often people start drawing these arrows between them, you know, what, you know, how does court decisions affect a tribal share of harvested fish? How does that affect subsistence fishing? Um, and th then how does that affect tribal community well-being? You know, so at the end of that, you know, at the end of those set of arrows, we can measure something about well-being. At the beginning of that, we can talk about kind of structural circumstances. And in the middle there, you know, we have to um, arrive at some concept of how humans and the ecosystem relate to, um, you know, human human outcomes. <laughs> And, and that's, that's a conceptual model, you know, we, as ecologists, once we have a conceptual model, we're trained to how, you know, how we can um, do scenario planning, like if we have future climate that affects uh, total water supply, how does that affect fish, and then how can that affect, you know, humans downstream from that. Um, we, you know, but the, in, in many ways, the hardest part of this process as a scientist is figuring out what, you know, how how does not just the ecosystem work, but how do humans connect with the ecosystem? Um, so this is one example of of a published example of this um, working with the Yakima Nation. And um, you know this is what we mean when we when we mean trying to spend a, you know three years developing indigenous conceptual models. Um, you know in terms of what this gets us, I mean, it gives us a better understanding of the ecosystem and what parts of it matter to people in different areas. And it could be, it could be that we do this for individual tribes, um, you know, or individual urban areas. Um, but, you know, obviously these, these sort of novel approaches, the goal of it is also to, um, you know, develop a network of people that are working together, um, you know, developing a sense of shared objectives of mutual respect and so on. So, um, you know, I put this as the first one because this is, you know, it's sort of the softest in terms of um, ecological science. You know, it's hardest to quantify, but it's also in some ways the most important part of the plan is trying to figure out how do we, as scientists, continue doing science, but do it in a way that can build build relationships. And, and I, I'll say up front, I don't know if this will succeed in three years or not, but I think the document is our... Um, public announcement of an attempt to try to do it. So number two is um, trying to improve communications to support co-producing science in the future with, with Arctic communities. And, you know, the goals are perhaps obvious about how to improve communications, you know, conducting more radio interviews and local, local newspaper features, developing educational materials, and better using existing NIMS communication platforms. You know, so this is 
sort of a comms a comms plan and we do have a com you know communications team at the alaska fishery science center that's very well integrated with our science activities um you know without putting anybody on the spot individually so um you know in terms of what this you know how we go about this you know um Mabel, I think, has been doing, you know, a, a variety of research about this and kind of a, a applications of how to improve communications. And I think um, Mabel, feel free to jump in if you want. But um, you know, some I, my understanding is some of her um, research is about different ways of doing this in terms of, you know, better, you know, just having more regular communications. Um, you know, reporting back to communities in a timely manner, don't, not using jargon, um, you know, frequently doing this and having two-way communications. And then um, in, in the process of doing that, trying to, you know, show respect and work together, show a commitment. And, um, and then also part of it is providing enough time to review information, you know. So in this Arctic wrap, you know, um, it will be out for public comment. You know, this talk is part of our effort to get input. Um, you know, we haven't tried to put together a, um, a slapdash sort of process for, you know, getting, getting input. Instead, we're really acknowledging that it will take, you know, multiple years to um, improve our process for getting input. So that we can do the next Arctic wrap if we if if it's considered a success by everybody, that we can do the next one in a more uh, co co productive way. Number three is um, to, you know, the Bering Sea does have this um, local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence task force. It's called. It's it was developed. It was established through the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, um, and I don't think that. In the Arctic, we we need to stay wedded to the the council format for that, and I think um, <clears throat> you know doing it outside the council could allow us to address a wider range of topics. But again, the, the exact shape of this, as it says here, will depend on whether any um, tribes or coastal communities are interested in in, in engaging. Um, and so I don't have like a lot of bumpers put on what this LKTK task force might look like. But, um, you know, it could be as simple as having sort of a panel of people who are interested in regularly talking as a group to figure out, um, you know, how we could better prioritize for a future Arctic wrap. Um, in terms of number four, you know, there's this thing called the Distributed Biological Observatory. It's sort of a, a program that many different agencies contribute to, and I'll talk more about it. The goals of the goals that we acknowledge in this document are that, um, you know, it's a it's a way that we send out vessels regularly and staff. Um, and I think that we could be adding beam trawls, exploratory large mesh trawling, and benthic respirometry. To better understand kind of the benthic environment, and as 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 I think we'll talk about later, you know, walruses and other kind of benthic foraging protected species are going to care about changes in the benthic environment, and that's not a thing that the DBO has previously, as I understand it, been heavily engaged with. But that is something that the Alaska Fishery Science Center is particularly interested in, and so that's how we could <clears throat> improve our targeted involvement with the DBO. Then environmental DNA is sort of this 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 concept that you can take water samples and um, in the water, free floating in the water is DNA from cells of animals that are nearby. You can amplify it and sequence it, and you can figure out what's the set of animals that have been near the water that you sampled. And so that would be, you know, we have these moorings that we deploy, and that would be a way to sample, you know, sample whether species are moving into the um, Beaufort and Chukchi from from the Bering Sea, for instance. So, um, you know, said in more detail here, the DBO stations are shown on the right. This is just a single cruise from the Healy in, in 2019 in August. Um, you know, shown here are some of the transects where they put out, um, you know, they have these quote stations where they do um, 
you know, physics measurements and they put out moorings that sample, um, you know, lower trophic level, you know, plankton and other um, basic cross seas. So this is sort of the, the platform that is already going out fairly regularly and that could be used to do more, um, you know, kind of benthic science that is important, I think, to protected species and, um, you know, different demersal species and some of those, you know, inshore stations. Um, in terms of ichthyoplankton, this is that, you know, the larvae of fish and they collect those in at those at those stations already. And, um, if, you know, if you if you look across species and across stations, you can pick out these patterns where some species, you know, Arctic cod or so, you know, cold water associated, yellow fin sole is warm water associated, um, and others are in between. And if you look at the, the distribution of those different warm or cold water species, just looking at the ichthyoplankton, the, the, the fish larvae, um, in 2010, there were warm water species further to the north than, for instance, in 2017. Um, and so, you know, we don't have a long enough record. I don't, I'm, I'm not aware of, um, how, you know, how to interpret that yet, but those are the types of um, designs that allow us to figure out, you know, whether um, species are redistributing northward. Um, in, you know, activity number five that we think is important is better using satellite information to predict harmful algal blooms and also kind of benthic species that, 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 that are major forage in the area, so snow crab, juvenile snow crab. We can use these um, satellite satellite based ocean color to look at phytoplankton community size and then we're hoping to develop a, a method that can use um, you know satellite information to better predict harmful algal blooms um, based on a relationship between diatoms which we think we can get from the satellite and HABs. and so this is this is super preliminary work and um, again it's the type of work that would be I think impactful um, I'm not the expert in this, like many of these topics, but it's something that the Science Center um, does believe is, 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 is feasible and warrants more research. So, <clears throat> for instance, in a, in a 2018 study, um, looking at a satellite-derived um, probability of diatoms and then comparing that with sea surface temperatures, we can get a, a prediction of harmful algal um, species abundances. And so this is the type of proof of concept that, you know, shows that we could try to link, you know, easy to obtain satellite information and ground truth these models with the limited field time, you know, ship time that we can afford um, to provide information that I think would be, as I understand it, would be relevant and useful to different communities in the area. Uh, we also hope to do this for crab condition where we're trying to, you know, we currently have funding to update samples we did in the Bering Sea back in 2012 and 2014, uh, where basically in colder years, there's a different collection of um, phytoplankton, a larger, larger cell, you know, larger sizes of phytoplankton in cold years. And that has a signal that you can track all the way into the crabs that feed on them once they sink to the bottom. And so, um, you know, in warmer years, we think that we could pick up satellite from the satellites that there's smaller sized plankton, and we could do field measurements to validate that that smaller sized plankton is worse for benthic foraging um, snow crab. And that would allow us, again, to kind of efficiently understand ecosystem change, even in years that we can't afford to send a vessel out. Um, and again, like, you know, snow crab and other benthic foraging you know, fish, even if nobody's um, eating them, they're important prey for, um, you know, benthic foraging marine mammals or other species that, you know, communities might care about. <coughs> the sixth activity that we're interested in um, that, you know, we realized talking internally that we're interested in um, is predicting um, overwinter survival of gadids, you know, cod and pollock. And so, um, you know, sorry, this, it should say summer warming. Um, I obviously write a lot of math and something got autocorrected to summing. 
Um, but yeah, like that, how does summer warming affect the condition, you know, the fat reserves um, in the fall of juvenile cod and pollock? And how does that fall condition, how much does the fat they have going into the winter affect their overwinter survival? You know, these are the types of things that we can study in laboratory conditions to gain a basic fundamental understanding of ecology. And that basic and fundamental understanding then allows us to predict what will happen even in new conditions that nobody's ever seen. So um, here's a, a, an experiment that colleagues, you know, Louise Copeman and Ben Laurel and others have done in Newport with these, um, you know, these chilled tanks and replicated experiments of, um, of Arctic cod survival um, based on different starting condition and different temperature treatments. And in warmer water, they starve faster. Um, you know, they burn through their energy reserves faster. And so, you know, as things are warming, um, one of the mechanisms that that's going to affect the ecosystem is by causing starvation potentially of Arctic cod, which is a major forage of seabirds and, and other species. Um, Number seven that we, we identified was um, improved kind of vessel-based surveys of cetaceans, of, of, of you know, seals. And, um, you know, we could do that both by using vessels to deploy these moorings, like the DBO moorings, and those record, they have these hydrophones that record sound. And, um, you know, our current hydrophones get a lot of signal from bearded seals. So we can detect when bearded seals are in the area of a different <coughs> mooring. You know, if we can filter those out, we can also pick out other sounds of other species that we might care about. And then we also, you know, think that there's a need for ongoing vessel-based and or aerial surveys to understand um, the distribution of cetaceans in the Chukchi Sea in particular. So um, again, here's sort of some of the DBO stations and the different um, PAM is these sort of acoustical moorings, and then the PAN and oceanography are the, are the acoustic moorings that are paired with a bunch of water physics sampling moorings. And so we've got this array. I mean, a, different, a bunch of different oceans are starting to do this. They do this on the East Coast, too. These types of moorings give a signal of when different species emigrate, you know, migrate into a given area. And, um, you know, there's been really anomalous timing, you know, phonology, they call it you know, seasonal timing of movement for different species. Um, as I understand it, like bowheads have also had some anomalous um, shifts in distribution, you know, seasonal distribution where they choose to be is what I mean. Um, you know, and so these moorings are a critical way for us to get a seasonal snapshot of when people, you know, when animals move by. And some of this, you know, improvements and how we process the giga and terabytes of information that are generated by these moorings, this is, we need artificial intelligence to process it. And some of that we have, you know, temporary and discretionary funding that's leading to the development. Other parts, you know, we'll have to figure out how we can do it. Um, and then the vessel, the vessel based, you know, methods are very expensive and they're also a unique platform for studying cetaceans in the area. And um, I think there's a recognition in the Alaska Center that um, we need to come up with ways to continue doing this. Um, you know, you can get distribution, you can get abundance, you know, the number of, of different species that are there, the age and size structure. You can get pictures of their condition, like are they fat or are they skinny, skinnier than you expect. Um, you know, and these are, these are, as I understand it, all things that are relevant to, um, you know, subsistence heart, you know, subsistence hunters. <laughs> we also um, acknowledge that there's a, a greater need for us to be doing work um, to understand the trophic role of ice seals, you know, how do ice seals interact in the ecosystem, what's their prey requirements, and how much are they eating in the ecosystem? Um, you know, how would the ecosystem change if ice seals because they lost a their plat a custom platform, you know, the platform of sea ice that they um, have use some species use as haulouts. You know, how would that affect the ecosystem? And so, um, here's a set of the 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 the, 
the flights that were conducted by the Alaska, you know, Alaska Fishery Science Center and partners, many partners. And finally, in 2021, we, as I understand it, we've completed for the first time ever, um, you know, transects in the Beaufort Sea. And so over the last decade, we have a complete picture of the, you know, Bering, Bering Sea, Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, including in the can a bit in the can and a bit in, bit in Russia. And, um, you know, we're currently processing those for different ice seals to get abundance and distribution and trying to predict their seasonal, um, about, you know, space use. And then we can combine that distribution and that total abundance with captive individuals where we can measure how much they, you know, for a given size or age of a bearded, a spotted or a ring seal, how much they eat. Um, you know, these captive individuals are sort of the gold standard for getting, you know, resting or active levels of consumption. Um, we can also use stomach content measurements from scat that we retrieve on the sea ice or um, you know samples of stomach contents from from hunters when they're willing to partner with adf and g or other agencies and um, you know that gives us a sense of what these different species are eating what species they're eating so this is just kind of a, a poll of data looking across species and then finally we combine this with um, prey energies, you know, so that Alaska Fishery Science Center will collect these fish and we basically put them in this bomb calorimeter, this device that burns them up and measures how much that heats up the water around it. We can measure how much the, how many calories a given gram of each fish species had. And so we've got all the different pieces here. We've got their abundance and distribution. We've got what they're eating and we've got how much energy they need and how much energy the different fish they're eating have. And so we've got this, for the first time ever, this capacity to understand how ice seals are affecting the ecosystem. And, and that gives us a sense of what happens as the distribution of ice seals changes. Um, number nine is a recognition that the Arctic Ecosystem Status Report, you know, so that the, council, the fishery, North Pacific Fisheries Management Council um, has these ecosystem status reports that I think some communities find helpful. Um, you know, it's not just a fisheries management, you know, commercial fishing thing, you know, it compiles a bunch of different indicators, including seabirds and marine mammals, you know, um, impacts to the seafloor, you know, many different things that could be of interest to different communities. And uh, the last time we did the Arctic Ecosystem Status Report, it was so long ago that we still counted the Northern Bering Sea as sort of the same ecosystem as the Chukchi. So if you look at the right, it included a wider area because the ecosystems were different back in 2015 when we last did this. Um, you know, we acknowledge that since 2015, having not done it last in 2015, I think there's an acknowledgement that we should make an effort to update this. And that would be um, a clearinghouse for us to compile ecosystem information and present it to a bunch of different audiences in a standard way question for you there if yeah. I can interrupt yeah. so yeah, please the Bering Strait region doesn't fit into the Bering Sea ecosystem report because it is the northern Bering Sea in a completely different ecosystem would there be what are you going to do with the Bering Strait region are you going to keep us in the Bering Sea or or are you going to discount us even though we are a part of the Chukchi Sea as well or would you do a Bering Strait ecosystem and then go further north, which would be probably more appropriate when you get to the different water um, and and different bathymetry and whatnot. Is so that a I'll, consideration I'll try, or is it just No, that, it a hundred percent is. We talk about this all the time. Like Okay. I, Thank you. You know, we it's hard to draw well, I'll I'll give you two answers before I go on a tangent. So um the short answer is that there's been push at the Alaska Fishery Science Center to put, you know, we've been putting a, a lot of effort into understanding the Northern Bering Sea more thoroughly than we have in the past. And, you know, I think that like Lyle has presented, you know, a bunch of efforts at the Groundfish Assessment Program and that whole pro division that Lyle now leads to um, do more consistent and informative sampling and report that back. And hopefully that's helpful. 
um, you know, the northern Bering Sea is getting more attention in the Bering Sea. So it's not just it's not just like a small piece of the Bering Sea that we acknowledge but don't do anything. We're actually trying to do a lot more. Um, you know, so you know, somebody in Nome who's interested in the northern Bering Sea. I think can get a lot of useful information and we'll keep getting more and more over the coming years. Um, but, you know, somebody in Diomede, like, you know, who's literally right on the border of the two of them, you know, that's, that is going to be difficult because, you know, that we, we have to draw a border anywhere. So, you know, somewhere, um, you know, my personal research in the habitat program is that, is that we should develop information that's local, and then we can make indicators that are relevant to any anybody anywhere. You know, so if we develop, if we have survey and we develop, if we synthesize it you know, spatially in a habitat specific way, we can develop an indicator for any different coastal community, and they would have the same quality information whether they're in the middle of an area or whether they're at the boundary. And that's that's my perspective in the habitat program. Um, I'm just thinking of all that I'm it trying to avoid that technical other, details of how we'd actually do that on the science side, but uh, I'm trying to think of the fact that it isn't it isn't a separate ecosystem north of Diomede. So from an ecosystem status report, um, it would that's all it would make sense yeah. to, be, to well, no move kidding. that I, line, and I think that's probably based on sort of commercial or old way of thinking um, on where the line yeah, is drawn I mean, and I think it's just there because it's close it's the narrowest portion but that is yeah I mean I like when I've done driven. you know like when I've seen like ben, you know let's take it in a really wonky direction if you if you do these kind of van bean grabs you know you co you take a, a sample of the sediment and you sort through all the worms and the clams that live in it you know as I understand it you know north of St. Lawrence Island, there's that sort of assemblage of amphipods that gray whales feed on. And then they're, you know, right at the strait, there it, it's a huge flux of water going, going by pretty fast relative to other areas. And so you get sandy sediment and you get a bunch of stuff that digs deeper into the seafloor. Um, you know, and so, you know, like in that way, the Bering Strait is a little bit different. And I do, I, not to quibble, but I do think that there's kind of a biogeographic break depending on what your taxa you're looking at at different places around the Northern Bering Sea. It, you know, we could also say there's another one north of, you know, Point Hope. And, um, anyway, I, there is real biogeographic breaks in different places, but I get your point that, you know, people, there's always going to be somebody who's on the boundary of any kind of artificial line that's drawn. It's an artificial line. I guess that's um, what I'm saying. You know, there's it's another good. interesting question. Hey, I'll, I'll get to it. Why don't we come back to it? Because it's fine. No, I'll, that's fine. It's good. You answered it. Thank you so much. Honestly, thank you. It's, it's yeah. I mean, the 11th one is also about, I'll, let's come back to it because I do want to get, there's another angle on that. Um, number 10, before I get to it, is to um, better develop our ecosystem modeling for the Arctic. So um, we have a Chukchi food web model. You know, these food web models are really important for us to understand, um, you know, how much productivity goes to the benthic environment and how much, you know, things that forage on the benthos get from that. And, that, and that's important because as the climate changes, you know, there, we think that there's going to be less, you know, smaller uh, plankton that will sink slower and less, less so down. And so there'll be a divert, a diversion of energy from the benthic component to the flagship component, you know, presumably people have talked about that. And so, you know, these food web models are really important for figuring out like, oh, do you think, you know, if it warms two degrees Celsius, do you think it's a 5% or 20% reduction in benthic energy? That's what, that's what these food web models can give us. So we want to update the Chukchi one using, you know, including ice seals, for instance, new information since we did that. Um, we want to Beaufort, Beaufort food web models so we can actually compare every Alaska ecosystem. And then we also sort of acknowledge that we need these sort of spa spatial synthesis models. So um, here's, here's some of what I'm talking about. So, you know, again, these are unfortunately 
drawn with this boundary at the at the straight. <laughs> um, but I do want to kind of you know he, I'll walk through it first. The the bottom left is the is the Van Veen grabs of total infonal abundance showing sort of this this increase abundance um, north of St. Lawrence Island. And there's this shift from the 80s to where there was a high, what we think this is showing is the amphipod densities that are important for gray whales. And that that density has um, dispersed somewhat and, and, and shifted in distribution. Um, we also have acoustic trawls that we did for Arctic cod showing differences in their spatial distribution in 2012 versus 2019. Each of these plots is showing a high density in kind of the yellow and a low density in the blue. I should have said that early. And then in the top right, we've got a comparison of 1990 versus 2012 for kind of larger snow crab, uh, larger sizes with a large mesh bottom trawl. Um, and I would say snow crab have not shifted as much as some of these other taxa. Um, but each of these, these are the types of models that we, we want to do, not just for the Bering, you know, not just for the Chukchi Sea, the Bering Sea, but we want to do them across the entire Northern Bering Sea and Chukchi. And so if somebody in Diomede is interested about how has the distribution of Arctic cod shifted, you know, we can tell them with the, with this model, you know, if they care about an area within a hundred kilometers of little Diomede, that we could give them that that spatial footprint and how every one of these different components of the ecosystem has changed. And that's what these types of spatial ecosystem modeling, this, this is my real like hobby, hobby horse and kind of passion work. Um, you know, I think maps like this, you know, everybody uses Google Maps. I think maps are a basic way for people to understand their lived environment. And I think that we should be able to provide relevant maps of um, of changes in the distribution and seasonal timing of things that people care about. <coughs> and then finally, I mean, this is, um, I think, you know, I'm, as with any of this, I'm happy to hear people's thoughts. Um, but I think there's a recognition that we do need to be trying to understand um, shifts in, you know, large bodied fishes that are moving northward. And we hope to do that by developing sort of a, a novel sort of combined bottom trawl and acoustic trawl design. And then in the Bering Sea, we have a separate acoustic trawl, acoustic and midwater trawl survey, and that's separate from our bottom trawl. We tried to combine them analytically, but I think we recognize that in the Arctic, it's so expensive for us to get up there that if we're going to do this, I mean, we would have to do it periodically in a collaborative way if we're going to do it, um, and that we would be better suited doing it in a way that combines bottom trawling and, and midwater trawling and acoustic information to get at large bodied species. So um, here, this, you know, not to confuse things, this is a picture of midwater trawling and acoustic backscatter that was done in the Arctic IERP. IERP, and it's, it's work that, um, a tremendous uh, student who's now going to be a postdoc, Robert Levine, is kind of put together and it's in review currently. Um, on the right is the size distribution. And we're talking about really small. These are these are age, age zero or age one fish. Um, you know, they're five at most 10 centimeters long. These are small Arctic cod and, and pollock. Um, and if you look on the left, here's the spatial distribution. So in 2017, you know, Arctic cod was 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 going well, you know, well in the you know middle Chukchi, um, whereas in 2019, you know, there was a much higher proportion of walleye pollock and jellyfish in the in, in throughout the Chukchi. Um, you know, but again, these aren't. There's no evidence that these are large-bodied pollock. Um, but you know the Chukchi is this sort of infective ecosystem, and so something is, you know, clearly something is changing between these years that's allowing small, you know, juvenile age zero, age one pollock to be infected northward into the Chukchi. Here's a picture of them, um, and and some of the um, transects over the year again showing that 
Arctic cod, you know, had relatively low abundance in 2012, you know, had much higher abundance by 2017. And similarly, walleye pollock had this had this real, really boom here in the in the Chukchi in, 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 in 2017. So these are the types of information that we could get with a with a with a tart, you know, a concerted an ongoing effort to um, have an acoustic and midwater trawl. Um, ideally, we could combine it with a bottom trawl. And here's work that we're doing, trying to in integrate, you know, synthesize our bottom trawling. In the top left is the otter trawl. It's like a small mesh. And because it's small mesh, you have a smaller total net size. Um, so that's called an otter trawl. And then the bottom, you know, maybe. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting this mixed up. The otter trawl on the left is the large mesh and it has, yeah, it has doors. And then the bottom right, I'm sorry, the beam is the beam trawl um, for smaller bodied species. And um, you know, if we if we fit all of our data that we've collected over a scattering of years of these two different gear types, we can estimate the density of these different species, Arctic cod, snow crab, barren flounder, saffron cod, and so on. And then what's shown in colors is these sort of efforts to figure out how we would stratify a survey. So, um, you know, if we if we're gonna if we're gonna randomly allocate places to to sample, you know, in the top left it shows for the um, the otter trawl, you know, that maybe we have a strata for along the coast in the southern Chukchi, then offshore, and then there's other strata where we go further north. And similarly, there's different kind of onshore, offshore bands for the um, the beam trawl on the bottom right. But this is how we could set, you know, use our existing information to build a survey design that gets us the most um, bang for a buck. So, um, I mean, that's it. I don't have uh, this isn't <laughs> I don't have um, a closing slide or anything like this. And I'm sorry that I rambled so long about it, but. Um, once again, thank you to Gay, and I'm happy to take questions for, for a while. I should have left more time, uh, but thanks, that, thanks to the authors. That's okay, because it's straight science. If if people have questions, they'll ask them, and we don't we don't close it off. So if you, if you unless they're really going crazy um, with questions, and we've done that. But I know I have a lot of questions, but first, thank you, Jim. So that was a lot to get through, and I think you did it in, in, in the time you had. I mean, that, that was a lot of information at us, and um, you did a good job. And for our straight science people that are out there in the audience, feel free to chat, hit the chat button, and give Jim Thorson some love from the Bering Strait region. It's never easy to be a speaker. Um, no matter how much you go over it, you're still like, holy cow, <laughs> once you get in there, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah. Speaking yeah. from experience myself. Yeah, no, no, no kidding. Totally. So, um, so thank you for that. And I have, I have a, a, a lot of questions now that I kind of understand that it, all these 11 moving parts and there's a planning process and whatnot. Um, but I want to make sure everybody else gets a chance to ask their questions. So I see we've got people from Anchorage and Nome and all over. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll share my screen again if people ask about stuff, but I just want to see like a face for a second before I go back. Yeah, that's right. You're, you're on your, um, that's a little different setup. So absolutely. So does anyone have any questions? Let me check the chat. You got a kudo. Thanks for the presentation. Does, but no questions. I'll, I'll ask we, a question if we can, if we can jump for back it, Peter. to the, yep. um, to the, uh, exactly the question that Gay had a minute ago, I was thinking, um, First of all, thanks for the presentation. I even think I, I understood most of it. Um, I'm, I'm really curious as to the boundary discussion that we were just having. Um, you know, there was the acknowledgement that it was somewhat arbitrary. And I'm wondering if you seek to put any kind of meaning into that boundary discussion or how you might do so, or what you might do with such a meeting, a meaning. Um, I, I think exactly to the discussion that you and Gay were having, you know, maybe depending on the species or what you're looking for, the boundary might change. Oh. Um, but the, the question that I thought about asking at that very first, as you were talking about it, is exactly the fact that as the climate is changing, 
what do you do with your boundaries? Do you keep them the same or do you shift them with the climate? So yeah. I'm, I'm curious as to how you're doing that. And then also if, you know, does it make sense to do, to kind of pick your boundaries depending on the culture of the people that live there? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so, um, thanks for the question. I, I could talk all day about like climate adaptive surveys and how we bring that information in. And that's, that's like my core research interest, you know, so, um, you know, since I joined the center, you know, my predecessor at Hepper had a part in sort of the bottom trawl work that we did in 2010 in the Northern Bering Sea. And then we did it again in 2017 and found a tremendous amount of pollock and cod had moved into the Northern Bering Sea between those two years, 2010 and 2017. And, you know, as I understand it, the 2010 sampling was not widely popular doing it. And we spent a lot of time trying to work with communities to alleviate concerns and to have a better uh, engagement so that they're, you know, and, 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 and I'm not, you know, okay, you should jump in. You know, this story better than I do. Lyle would know the story. Um, I just hear about it. Um, you know, I think that people, I'm told that a lot of people appreciate the work that we've been doing in the Northern Bering Sea over the past years where, you know, anybody with eyes will see that there's big changes and we're up there actually, you know, showing, putting numbers on it, you know, of, of, of how the ecosystem has changed. So that's a boundary. We used to think that Northern Bering Sea was this ice dominated system that was more like the Chukchi and that's how we talked about it. And that boundaries shifted and we've had to do these sort of spatial models to understand, you know, bring in new data. Scientifically, people want consistent data and climate forces you to start changing the boundaries and all of the way we did science wasn't prepared for that and so we've stepped into that using spatial models that allow us to stick together different data sets and all of the different panels i have here are different data sets that were not designed scientifically to generate a whole picture but we are figuring out ways of doing that in a way that can pass scientific muster and give credible science um the harder question is the people the people side right so um Scientifically, I think it would be really interesting to do um, targeted bottom trawling north of Bering Strait. Um, and I think scientifically it would be, um, you know, part of the plan acknowledges that we need baseline information. The last time we had a large mash bottom trawl, for instance, up north is 2012, which is shown here for snow crab. And so we don't know anything about any large body, you know, anything concrete about large body fish or crabs in the Chukchi since 2012. Um, and so that one of the earlier plans for the DBO kind of acknowledged that we, you know, when we, when we're already going up and sampling the physics and the lower trophic levels, we could do a little bit of beam trawling or, you know, large mesh bottom trawling in conjunction with that, and that would allow us to give a, a picture. The eDNA that we want to do would also give us a picture. Um, and then if, you know, ultimately, if those sort of change detecting ways, those sort of fixed points that we can do exploratory work show that there's a big change, that's why we need a survey design in place <laughs> so that we can sell to our, um, people, you know, bean counters, um, that we have an efficient way to do this, um, you know, explain to them, I should say, um, you know, and, and, and can, and can get up there and actually, you know, adapt as the, you know, the actual ecological boundaries shift, but none of that's possible unless we have sort of buy-in from, from people in the area. And again, that's the, you know, the bottom line of why we need to improve communication in the area. Is that, is that at all a sufficient way of trying to address that question? Yeah, let me, let me. Um, I've got a, I've got a question, Peter, if I can, unless you yeah, this will follow up and then we'll, we'll take turns. Uh, it was kind of a follow up. Okay, so, go for it. Go for it. Absolutely. Um, you know, what, 
problems do you envision having trying to get local community buy-in when you're talking about a species that because of climate change might no longer be in that region and so vice versa i could imagine that some community might say hey you know we've spent thousands of years eating arctic cod and now we don't see it anymore but we're seeing lots of other things so we need to know about these things yeah. you know do you envision based on the fact that there is this for lack of a better term migration do you see do you envision difficulties working with communities based on that yeah i mean i the, yeah the short answer is yes i do and um i you know i wish i had more contacts up there to give you concrete examples i you know, my understanding is that Lyle and the bottom, you know, Dwayne Stevenson and um, Emily Markowitz have, you know, gave gave a, a straight science talk recently and, and have also done these sort of updates about what what we're seeing whenever we do a big bottom trawl surrey in the Northern Bering Sea, you know, and we try to show not just the kind of um, large bodied fish, but we also try to show a bunch of invertebrates that, that I in Seattle have never eaten. Um, but I gather are important to different communities in, um, in the area. Um, you know, that's one difficulty is sort of, um, you know, getting over our own kind of cultural biases. And I don't like, I don't think there's any way to do that except just, you know, like the, this, you know, we talked about this LKTK task force, like having a panel of people who can regularly talk with us would allow, I think, I hope would allow us to figure out what's, the most relevant science to be doing, not what sounds fun. Um, yeah, and then and then again, I mean, um, I'm scared to get into you know <laughs> hot button topics. I you know like I think that there are sometimes concerns that I've heard that there were concerns that you know the large mesh bottom trawl survey would damage the seafloor, and you know and the science of it is that the the surveys we do survey a tiny, tiny slice, and we use science to figure out the picture and how it shows the whole ecosystem. Um, you know, but there's no way, you know, that's a valid concern, and there's no way to address that in communities unless we just go up and talk with people about, you know, this this is this small but non-zero impact that a bottom trawl survey could have. And, you know, we need to have that conversation before we can do bottom a bottom trail survey where we're not you know where where, where where you haven't been doing it so anyway mabel or other people from the science center feel free to jump in if i'm direct you know okay. responding badly uh, could, could you hear me yeah, yeah. Uh, okay so all hands down the marine environment is of high value to rural and ind indigenous communities in alaska because it supports not only like cultural, but economic, social, and spiritual components. And a significant and growing awareness is that these marine resource-dependent communities are broadly affected by natural resource management practices. And we at Alaska Fisheries Science Center are working diligently to develop effective and cooperative research networks in rural Alaska. Yeah. So Thank you, Mabel, and thank you, Jim. Peter, are you are you set for yeah, that? Yeah, that was question? excellent. Thanks very much to both Jim and Mabel. All right, I, I have a question. Um, oh, go ahead, Dean Stockwell supersedes me. I see his hand is up. Go ahead, Dean. Nice presentation. Really appreciate it. Whatever species you look at, whatever fish species, shellfish species, marine mammal species you're looking at you're dealing with a, an environment that's basically non-uniform in space and time. You, you see the oscillations from year to year in, I'll call it weather rather than climate. Yes, we have a long-term climate change. Uh, we see distributions widely swinging in where productivity maxes are, where food and prey distributions occur. There are temperature variations from year to year, 
from decade to decade. There's salinity field variations from east to, to west, to north to south. There's ice distributions that complicate all of these looks, whether you're looking at Arctic cod, saffron cod, or any of these species. So the breakdown in the thermal barrier allowed a, lar a lot of large fish predators to move north and really impact the benthos in the last few years. Is there a terrestrial counterpart that you can use as a model to help you, assist you in, in looking at these models that you're predicting? And I know you're, you're reaching out, I'm a productivity person, and I know when, when you look out at uh, satellites, satellites can only give me like the upper five meters of ocean water and a lot can happen below that you can have a chlorophyll max you can have habs you can have all kinds of things so i'm always suspect and relaying on satellite imagery so how, how do you put this together and is, for example it, can you do the same thing with a caribou migration i don't know yeah i i love that question so i i'll just do three short answers on it from different angles. I The first one is I tried to work with a bunch of people from Canada on spatial models of caribou and forest fires in Canada, and we didn't get it funded. And so if anybody here can help me get funded to do caribou work, I'd be happy to do it. I, um, you know, I like, I do think these sort of like migratory animals across systems um, are, are fascinating to study. There's a lot of phenology, there's age structure, there's a lot of similar dynamics and, um, it's, it's, you know, we need to be working across systems. I've been, that's sort of, you know, my first answer. The second answer is, I don't think any region by itself is gonna have the data to understand these things. You know, the whole point of climate change is it makes a world of ecological surprise. So we're making a world in which nobody knows what's gonna happen. We can do a lot of process research and we'll understand parts of it, but. A lot of ecologists, I think, acknowledge that ecological surprise occurs even in very well-studied systems. And really, you know, I think, honestly, I think that we need to do more comparative work between formerly ice-dominated systems, you know, Alaska, um, the Barents Sea, you know, the Ross Sea, you know, and I, I'd love to collaborate with people on more comparative studies of ice-dominated systems and how they you know how rapidly for instance like antarctica you know everybody was confused that sea ice was was not going down as fast there and then i think they've had some big, big changes recently so um you know that there's a common thread across ice dominated ecosystems that there's big rapid changes and they occur sporadically <laughs> i'm not an expert in this so i probably should stop the kind of speculating i just get excited about it um, ecologically um yeah, and then, you know, yeah, how do you put together kind of messy data? I, you know, I think that we need to, we need, you know, I think the moorings and eDNA would give us seasonal pictures. I think satellites would give us a consistent picture of a tiny slice of the ocean at the top. And, and then we're going to have process studies that allow us to connect, you know, like satellite measurements with benthic stuff and i just don't i don't think there's any shortcut i just think we have to put in the work to do science and connect across these these components is that that's answer my answer question? you can take it or leave it <laughs> yeah. yeah well i originally started working in the antarctic and back then the ross sea the waddell sea diatom dominated community large amounts of krill the krill fed penguins they fed whales that system's changed uh, I think what we're seeing in the Bering Sea will be a shift that way. And the people of the region are going to depend on direction, but they also have to have a certain amount of adaptability. You may not have Arctic cod. You may have to shift to another species. Yes, it's against culture. It's against all kinds of things, but there's an adaptability that the region's going to have to use. And I think most people of that region have been very adaptable in the past, and I think they'll be successful. Thanks, Dean. And I think that leads into, and I think that leads into my question, if I can ask one. All right. So, so 
the Chukchi scene, this is why I don't want the border in Diomede. Because what happens just to the south side of the island is considered Bering Sea, and what happens to the north side of the island is considered Chukchi. And there's nothing in this strait that isn't interconnected because of the narrows. You really need to pump it up out yeah. of that that flushing zone, honestly. So anyway, that that's just that. But my question is, or, or my comment is, we once you get to the north end of Diomede, there is no commercial fishing in US waters. There's a magic line drawn from Diomede to Wales, you shall not pass if you've got a fishery, a, a federal fishery, um, or a fishery in federal waters, right? And this region that you're talking about, the Chukchi, which is the Bering Strait region, has seen like crazy changes. We have, I mean, the loss of the thermal barrier, the arrival of the Pollock. We've seen seabirds, our seabirds are starving. Seals had had trouble trash as the industries are coming right trash has been a thing and so we see at the environmental ecological anthropogenic it's all yeah. happens duh, and happening and it's been yeah. doing this for for you know yeah tw 2017 was when the boats came up but you could say it's been happening for a, much longer but it's really sped up i'd say in the last 10 years and currently those changes are impacting in the northern Bering Sea, which is the southern Chukchi Sea, abundance, health, and access to our to our marine resources for any community member, right? Yeah. Whether you're a commercial fisherman trying to get king crab, whether you're a, a community member trying to get a bowhead, it has been quite something to see what has happened already changed we have right now there are very large vessels transiting in the ice right now through the strait and that will continue on into the future i have no doubt probably in more number and we have on the russian side the advent of commercial fishing this year Pollock. They took it on and they didn't even start down here. They started, they were going gangbusters opposite point hope. That's central yeah. Chukchi yeah. Sea. And I think everyone here, and I'm just I'm just saying, you know, these are these are thoughts as a person who lives here. Um the re Dean's right on it. The residents, I mean, people have lived here for five thousand years, ten thousand, I don't know. People here, been, people have been here for a long time, and just by the fact they're here, shows people are adaptable. But all these changes right now are happening really fast, and and you guys are coming up into the Chuck Chi. And so here's my question, because I was looking at those eleven things, for residents to adapt, we need like information so people can move forward. And for the incoming entities, whether it's commercial fishing, ship traffic, Russian, blah, blah, they're going to need information too. Yeah. My question as a, as a resident here is given that the Chukchi has already withstood massive change and it's still ongoing, it hasn't stopped, it's transitioning or transmorgifying or whatever you want to call it. Um, what i that overarching question so for communities here to move forward the biggest question is regardless of pick your species is what would you be doing research wise that would get at the question of food security wildlife health and by wildlife i mean you pick a noah animal a, a, a bearded seal or a, a, a pollock yeah. or a sculpin or whatever it is that you guys have management authority on. And we know that Fish and Wildlife has the walrus and the seabirds, you know, so it's kind of not all up, not all on NOAA's to do this, but what what would you overarchingly, like the objective would be to look at food security issues, both for commercial, the country, or for our regional community, because food security and wildlife health are like the two massively important questions that we have and that completely goes back to human health because yeah. everyone here whether you're commercial in this region whether you're a commercial uh whatever of a, a fisherman 
or you're a subsistence fisherman or maritime user, whatever you want to say it, you're eating right from the sea. And people need to know, A, how to move forward. So they want to know what that is why I think, you know, NOAA Race Division with their bottom trawl surveys, they have been knocking it out of the park. They come and do street science. They do face-to-face -face meetings. They made a whole report that is just for this region. And they yeah. give it to us. We ask and they do it. And they show up and do a tremendous amount of work under tremendous amount of pressure to get with tremendously quick deadlines um, to satisfy and, and get public information out. So people here can know, okay, the crab offshore, we may know through the fish and game crab or the state managers. Yeah. We may know what's going on near shore. So it's been a real big eye opener to get that, that resolution that they're getting and to get it back to the people about kind of comprehensive what's going on on the seafloor or even I think we had uh, Jim Murphy who gave his salmon totally. surface trawls or something like yeah. that and so is that is that what would what win that plan I saw 11 steps but I didn't see like that's that's what I mean I, I think it's in there I I do I that, there's so much in that question I'm not gonna be able to answer it I okay you know, no no like, that's fine that's I, just I, like no, no, that. No, but, that, but I but I'll, I'll hit piece of it so okay um I you know like the Alaska Center, you know, it's it's 300 people, you know, 300 permanent staff and a bunch of contractors across multiple states and a lot of area. And, you know, a person can know something, but that doesn't mean that the center is doing it. The center needs to make big plans and, and plans take time. And that's, you know, that, you know, if, if three years from now, we have an Arctic ground that dials into food security, I would think it's a success. So. You know, three years might sound like a long time, but that's how long it takes for three. No, no, that's a blink of an eye. Can you this old? So, yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, the steps that it requires to get there is some, you know, some trust about a lot. You know, that we can do the work without damaging the environment, uh, and we'll get there. We won't. You know, it, it requires some contacts to prioritize. Like, does this community care mainly about the timing of sea ice? You know. Like shore ice melting and tom cod, does this community mainly forage on, you know, bearded seals in the fall? You know, that that's the kind of stuff that people know, but the agent, you know, the Alaska Center hasn't developed our uh, shared understanding of what matters to who outside a few cases that we can work closely with. Um, so that's, you know, that's where I think those first three activities about, you know, indigenous conceptual model, having a better communication plan that LKTK task force would allow us to have context to figure out, you know, for Diomede, we just keep bringing up Diomede, um, you know, for Diomede, what are the, what are, you know, they, they care about these species more than these, these are the ones that they're going to want to Well, you've about. split them in half by having that line there. That's the tough. Let's just, I'm just using them as an example. Yeah, I, yeah, no, no. I, I, I don't want to get hung up on the line thing again. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I hate that line division right there. Well, I get, hey, people love talking about this. <laughs> But yeah, I'm trying to answer the original question before it gets yeah. back in the lot. I food you know, security. Take a different community then. But yeah, I mean I you know, like different communities are different and they're gonna care about different things about food security. So the, the bottom, you know, the starting point is communication and trust. And if you try to if you try to skip the communication and the trust, you're gonna build a bunch of stuff that people don't trust and is targeted. Oh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think, don't think I'm all for skipping either one of those words. No, not at yeah, all. Yeah, I mean so yeah, so 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 that's the you know that's the beginning, and then and then a lot of the other parts of the plan are about kind of baseline information that we can then dial in to to to, to deal with kind of local concerns. Uh, in terms of the shipping, you know, Libby Lagerwell and I have worked with a bunch of people, including a bunch of people at UAF on this Arctic IER piece. It's supposed to be fun with, and you know, if we do that, we will try to be, you know, enables involved with that and then Sarah Weiss and other, you know, credit work with communities to figure out, you know, when you mean communities, will you, will you guys be coming to Nome, that kind of thing? Or are you uh, only working I with mean, tribes? We haven't, we haven't I, kicked I, I out the, yeah, I mean, I, Sarah would know more than me. I don't think okay. I'm not here to announce a new, <laughs> but I mean, we would have a process okay. to decide which ones we focus on. We do know that we would try to, um, uh, uh, pull out shape files of shipping lanes and you brought that up. Uh, well, I think you know, pe like, people are concerned, like, are is the ice 
We have a thousand foot tanker just past past Diamond. You know, we were saying totally exactly. So I mean, we, is that making the that. ice? We can figure out how that over, that the, the shipping routes have shifted over time and how that intersects yeah. with different species of interest in different communities. You know, that's the type of work that you can do once you have a spatial map of different species and their seasonal distribution. And that was another one of the activities that I talked about. So I think a lot of the concerns that you had are things that different activities that are different ones those 11 activities address. But I get your point that it wasn't packaged around. No, 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 I meant my overarching, and I'll stop. My overarching thing is just that I think you guys should look maybe at it as overarching would be for communities. And I, it sounds like you're only working with tribes, but I think you're working with everybody, maybe. I don't know. Maybe that's a question for Mabel. But but the um, um, overarching kind of concerns is there's so much change has happened. Where are we? Like the Russians are fishing. We don't even know where the Pollock are in, the, in our waters. What does that mean? And and then what does it mean for public food security for the for the peoples of all of the Chukchi, Beaufort, and Bering, all all of Western and that's Alaska? Where, that, that's the stuff where I'm not going to be able to answer it. But if I if okay, I were you, okay. if, if no, I were you, I would be interested in you know, like I'm as a scientist, and I think people living in the Chukchi would be hopefully are interested in you know the Russian catch. I'm, we're probably not going to get public data about the catches they're having off of the opposite side of Point Hope. You know, maybe if we're lucky, we well, will. Well, that's, that's, that's a whole other yeah, so, no, exactly. um, so, question I had, do, but, I, but I see what Dean we could do is get surveys over on our U.S. side and have a better picture of the U.S. side. And I think that's the type of science that it would be interesting for us to do. Sounds good. I, Dean, your hand is still up and I've been blabbing too long. Go ahead, Dean. So I understand your need for boundaries in all of your models. I mean, it's a necessity. And you can move them, you can shift them. But as Gay pointed out, the Russians are now fishing up on the Russian side of the Chukchi. Let me ask you this. Do you have a way of estimating or predicting the impact of fisheries on the U.S. side and what that would do to basically marine mammal populations or food security for people of the eastern side of the Chukchi. I mean, that's something you can probably model and estimate from information that you've collected in the, the southern Bering Sea or the northern Bering Sea and get an estimate on, esti estimate on the, the impacts of those types of fisheries. Um, yeah, you're saying like catches on the western check, like the Russian side and how that would affect our side? Is that what no, you're... what happens if it opens up on the U.S. side? Got it, yeah. You, I, you can probably model that. Totally, and that's, and that's again, I mean, that's sort of one of the things that that, you know, that I forget the number, it might have been number 10, you know, these sort of trophic and ecosystem models that, you know, we haven't, you know, the Chukchi one was, you know, our first pass, and, and then people at UAF, I think, trained you know, as a student, kind of dating it. but those are not as well developed as some of the models we have elsewhere. Um, those are the types of models that would allow us to, you know, start answering that question of like, oh, if there was a big fish, you know, fishery for this or that, and this is how it might propagate through the ecosystem. Um, yeah, I mean, so I agree that those are the types of questions we could answer. Again, like the plan, I think, is trying to make kind of basic infrastructure, science infrastructure, and then try to build these, you know, networks, communication networks, so we can decide is is the thing that people want us to be answering is it about that fishery impact, or is there, or is it more about near shore tom cod? I I have no idea. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so I don't think we want to be taken on a big, really specific science task until we have a, a, a thing in place to know what's the important question. But as we all know, the system is in a state of flux right now. And anything that you measure is in that kind of netherland uh, uh, of fluctuations. And, and so it's hard to get baseline information it's to not really... baseline totally but it's it's it yeah we're track we're tracking change yeah yeah okay all I, right well I'm thank sure you Dean. Baseline, but I sorry yeah. <laughs> no that's okay 
Uh, Jim, are you okay for like just a, one or two more questions, and then we should yeah, wrap it up? Yeah, I was admitted it's by eight. nine here, and my I know. I was thinking you're doing it's great, and it's it's um, late, Tur, because you're in a different time zone than us. Well, we also have a two bedroom, and I'm like kind of shouting right next to my kid who's sleeping. Okay. I, I, yeah, let's let's hit one or two more questions, and I'll get there. All right. Anybody else have a question? The transboundary, you, you made me sad. I, it sounds like um, transboundary communications are going to be a problem, and I hope Noah maybe attacks it, use your international op or Office of International Affairs, do something, but please do not stop trying federally to federally to get that. Don't go through some other quick and easy way. Do it, do it right correctly as the I, federal yeah, I government mean, I wish should. I, could, I wish I could talk with you over beer, but I will. But, but know I'll this, know this for fisheries, we've had since November, you were asking about fisheries. It's, I know it sounds like it's pretty grim and I'd love to have a beer, but for the, for the region, since November, we've had two videos sent over from the other side of bycatch of walrus, adult walrus. And this is something that you know, now if you look, the Russian fishery Pollock fleet is in the northern Gulf of On or sorry, they're in the southern Gulf of Onadir. They're honestly, some of them are actually north of Cape Navarin, which is amazing. It's January and they're actually some guys fishing uh, heavy, large vessels and they're fishing and right up to the ice. And this is the third week of January. So walruses are coming down and uh, I don't think we've seen the number of, of um, opportunities for this to happen, but you know, it seems interesting that we've had already two uh, videos of adult walruses being pulled up and looks to be Pollock and certainly they're, they're not our fleet they've, at all. And um, you know, those kind of images are going around the region right now. So know yeah. that those kind of concerns will be something that as those things will be of concern. They're concerned, like right now, are the Russians fishing? When they are fishing, the other place they went was once they left Point Hope in August or, August or September, yeah. they, three of these processors went 40, about 40 miles off one of the largest walrus haulouts uh, in the world for Pacific walrus. And they're yeah, trawling. So, I don't, I don't so have, those I kind don't of things are what- the Tuxi and the walrus piece, but-, but that we did do, you know, we have a study that got published working with Russian scientists from Tehran Vinco on the Western Bering Sea, you know, south of the Strait. And, and we had been doing sort of spatial um, synthesis of the West, the Eastern, the Northern, and the Western Bering Sea to understand the portion of Pollock and Cod yeah. that we think have moved, not just into the Northern Bering Sea, which is a story everybody there knows, but that we think they also have Build from the Eastern Bering Sea into the Western, sure. and you know, and and, and, and we are making headway on that. Uh, but you know, I'm that just I, saying I, those are the kinds of things that. with your yeah. trawlers moving, your science moving north. That might be something that that does, depending on times of year and things. Or what are the impacts? Literally, literally, just a mile over the line, you know, at a yeah. place like the Bering Strait. What are the impacts of the Russian fishery on our which, which will be in an hour, our resources, right? Yeah. A Russian walrus is an American walrus as long as he swims, if he just swims yeah, over yeah. on our side. So are these impacts, those kind of things are might be what people are concerned about as well as we see there. There's all kinds of concerns I think the region has and, and you can't sort of tease it out because the, um, the resource is so shared, you know, literally yeah. in the Bering Street region, everything is swimming, you know, it doesn't know the border. So my it. last I, I actual it. question of the night is, how do we join in? How do we comment? How does this process going to bring us in? Please let Good us know, question. and we will try to to raise up yeah, our voices. Yeah, I'm so sorry. You know, you, you you and I had an email with Maggie, and we were really hoping that the um, headquarters would have the um, all three of our. You know, we've got the Bering Sea Regional Action Plan. We've got this one that I presented, the Arctic one, which is the Beaufort Chachi. But, uh, and then we've got a Goa, Gulf Alaska one. Uh, and we were really hoping all three of those to be out for public comment. And again, I don't, I don't, I don't know why they're not out for public comment yet, but they they will be okay. soon. And you for sure will hear about it because that's a very high priority for me and Maggie. So is it the so, kind of thing you'll blanket like 
Gnome Nugget, KNOM, maybe do a stream. I don't sign. know that. Okay. <laughs> I, I haven't been around long enough to know uh, what strategy we'll use, but we will okay. certainly be in contact with you, Gay, and, and if you were uh, willing to talk with us about how to distribute Absolutely, them, so absolutely. Actually. I think everyone's wanting to, if this is a plan of how to direct the research for NOAA, I think it's an awesome thing that's brand new, and um, I really, really thank you for speaking tonight. And our questions were, you know, but I, I, I am grateful to you. And it sounds like it's a plan that in two or three years, you know, as you're getting ready for the next one, you can work right now with talking and meeting and 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 en engaging with communities from yep. the Bering Strait region all the way up to North Slope Borough, which I'm sure will be really, really interested in in um, how, how this is, you'll have all kinds of comments. I, probably very different than ours. That's the intent. Yeah. yeah. And so thank the intent you for reaching already be doing that. And if it weren't for COVID, hopefully we'd be further along, but yeah. Yeah, thank No, you I so really much. appreciate it. And I think people in this region and uh, would welcome an opportunity to voice up. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much. Come back again.